Hello and welcome everybody, King Demps here. This video, we are gonna take a little look at G2. Now, obviously there have been two roster swaps for G2, a G2 that was by all accounts pretty successful last year, second in the major, some decent placings outside of that. Overall, probably the third best team of the year last year. So definitely not a year to be sniffed at by any means. However, Carlos, the guy in charge at G2, is an ambitious guy. He wants his teams to be the best of the best. And so they have made some ambitious moves in this offseason. Now, the first thing I want to do is look at some of the problems that existed in G2. And then we'll take a look at the transfers and see if they fix these problems or if they seem at least to address the issues. Now, the first and most obvious problem I think on G2 was... Amanek not being good enough as a dedicated AWPA. Now, I want to preface this before I go any further by saying I do not think by any stretch of the imagination that Amanek is a bad player. I actually think if I were to build my ideal G2 out of the pieces you can see on the board, plus maybe let's include Alexi B, we'll talk about the potential Alexi B swap later, I would probably include Amanek in place of Jax, to be quite frank. I think Amanex is a very versatile player. He has shown an ability to get frags with a range of different weapons. His Mac 10 proficiency, for example, is impressive uh, and no joke. The problem is, is that he simply wasn't good enough to be a dedicated player with the big green gun. He missed shots too often. He wasn't consistent enough. He wasn't really capable of taking over a game, particularly against the best teams in the world. And in heads up duel against any other AWPA in the top 10, maybe even in the top 15 to 20, I would take the other AWPA over my Amanek every single time. In a meta of CSGO where the AWP is so important and it is very, very important, Amanek, I'm sorry, he just was not good enough to be a dedicated AWPA. He was always going to be a problem if you had him as your dedicated AWPA and you wanted to be a top team in the world. Now, the next issue I saw with G2 was actually Nexa as a sight anchor on CT. That might seem like a strange thing because I don't think to many people Nexa will have stuck out as anything of an issue for G2. The problem I saw with Nexa on CT side in particular is that he was trusted to be an anchor on a lot of bomb sites on CT side. So for example, he would often be the anchor on the B site of Inferno. The problem is, is that Nexa would die too often without getting anything done as the anchor. As an anchor, you need to go one for one at the very, very least. If not, try and go two for one. And he simply didn't play smart enough a lot of the time. He would die very early when the hit was coming in. He wouldn't give his team enough time to rotate. He would basically swing and take a duel a lot of the time and just get his head blown off. I actually think Nexa as a sight anchor was definitely a problem on G2 CT side. So I think that Nexa going could actually potentially remedy that problem depending on what happens with the players that come in. Now, something that isn't necessarily a problem but is definitely something that needs worth mentioning is Nexa as a leader in G2. Now, it never seemed like the leadership of G2, the calling was a particular problem. However, when Nexa was not part of G2, so for this IEM Winter 2021 run, the leadership didn't seem to suffer at all. G2 still made it to third to fourth in this event, and if we take a look at their run, yes, they had a bit of a shaky game against Tai Lu, but they got over the line in that one. Pretty solid win against Liquid. They were two relatively close maps, but honestly, if you watch the series, G2 felt like the only team that were going to win this series. And most impressively, they beat Vitality in the upper bracket finals. On the balance of things, in the back end of the year, Vitality were probably the number two team overall in the world. Maybe you can make an argument for Gambit. But the fact that G2 were able to beat Vitality without Nexa as a leader, I think it does kind of put a little bit of a mark against Nexa's name, potentially. Now, that actually brings me on to the next problem with G2, and this has nothing to do with Nexa. The one game that G2 did lose in this tournament was to NIP in the semi-finals. And if we just take a look at it, it points to one of the other problems that I think G2 suffered from with this lineup. Now, what I'm referring to here is the G2 collapse. Infamous 
and annoyingly frequent. They would have these halves in these maps where they would be in the driver's seat looking comfortable to win it, looking like the better team easily, and they would somehow lose the map. This one is a perfect example. If you look here, they were much better rated as a team than NIP. They got themselves to 13-8 and they were on the CT side in economic control. You should cruise to the closing this one out every time if you're a top five team in the world. And this wasn't a full strength NIP. This was an NIP with Fuzzy Fuzzy in the lineup. And just look what happened here. They just collapsed. They just fell apart. Hampus was calling a very puggy style on this T side as well, which, especially with economic control, should be punishable. And yet somehow G2 found a way to collapse. Yes, this one was without Nexa, but they also did it with Nexa in charge of the team. So I think changing the lineup will hopefully eliminate that tendency if you're a G2 fan. That remains to be seen. Now, we obviously have to look at who G2 are bringing in. And I think in terms of the primary AWP problem, bringing in Monacy could be an excellent solution. Now, we have to preface this by saying, yes, Monacy is very, very young. He's a young guy, and he does not have a lot of experience at the top tier of Counter-Strike. But if we're talking in terms of raw skill, if you've watched this guy play, he looks the real deal. And some of these numbers that he's putting up at this level are absolutely astronomical. Just take a look at We Play Season 1. They came 5th, plus 200 kill differential over 18 maps. A 1.64 rating, over a kill per round, over 18 maps. It doesn't matter that this isn't the highest level of opposition. Yes, of course it isn't. Those numbers are astronomical and deserve respect regardless of the opposition. Now, one thing I do actually want to take a look at is we're going to take a look at this loot bet season nine, where as you can see, he has pretty good statistics, not the same level, obviously, as the we play season, but this is a tier two event. And if we take a look at the field, which we will in a second, these were some pretty legit opposition. As you can see here, this is the final standings for that event. Na'Vi Jr. did not come last place, which in itself is a success for a very, very young team and academy team. And as you can see, the field here is actually pretty legit. Entropic, very good team this year. Probably, definitely inside the top 20 teams of the year, if you were to analyze the year overall. Ents had a very good year. Fiend, we know they're a legit tier 2 team. Got lots of raw skill and aim. And you can just look at the rest of the num names. And if we go down here, Na'Vi didn't make the playoffs, but... There is some decent tier 2 opposition that they played here and that Monzi was putting up pretty solid numbers against. Um, I would pick out LDLC as some good opposition. I would pick out Endpoint as good opposition. So, in all fairness, Monacy, when he was asked to beat slightly better opposition than maybe some of these academy teams, he did pretty well. I also ultimately expect Monzi to have the right attitude. And when I say that, I do mean the level of arrogance that he displays. I think this is only going to be beneficial for a player so young coming into the pro scene. He needs to have a huge amount of belief in himself and his own skill to overcome those experience issues and those issues with being unfamiliar with the tier one environment and particularly probably the LAN environment. He's not going to have played very many LANs. He's going to have played absolutely no top tier LANs. So I think the level of arrogance that Monacy has displayed, if it rubs people the wrong way, I think it's only going to be beneficial to him settling in at the very top level. Finally, to summarize, do I expect Monacy to be an upgrade over Animanek? Give him a couple of months to settle in, but yes, I do. I quite frankly do expect Monacy at the very least. If he's not the superstar that some people are making him out to be, he will definitely be an upgrade as a dedicated AWPA over Animanek. Of that, I'm pretty confident. Now, the next move we have to talk about, and this one is as of yet unconfirmed, but it seems pretty likely that this deal is done and dusted, is swapping Nexa for Alexi B. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is Alexi B's style as a leader. By all accounts, according to people who have listened into OG comms during OG games, Alexi B is something of a micromanager. Now, I don't think that is going to be the appropriate style to utilize on this G2 lineup. 
I can't see Nico reacting well to micromanagement. I don't think Hunter necessarily is going to need or react particularly well to that micromanagement. And Monacy, if you look at his mentality and his attitude, I don't know if a player who is that skilled and is that arrogant is going to react well to the leadership, a micromanaging style of leadership either. Even if potentially for a young player who's inexperienced, it might be beneficial. I don't think Monacy is going to react well to it. So that could be a potential problem. On the flip side, I think Alexi B seems intelligent enough to understand that maybe he needs to adapt his style of leadership for G2. And I think he's got the capability of doing that, quite frankly. He seems like an intelligent guy. By all accounts, he seems like a pretty good leader. I think Alexi B should be able to fit in with the team and fit his management and his leadership style with the team. So I'm not too concerned about that, but there is a potential problem there that shouldn't necessarily be overlooked. I think the other thing that we have to look at is OG's record last year. I don't think OG overall was the success story that maybe it could have been. If we look at their year, first of this still series invitational throwaway event, we're not going to talk too much about that. The real highlights were IEM Summer, obviously good run, beat some decent teams there. That is definitely probably the peak of their year. And then their EPL Season 14 run was good, particularly the group stage. They looked fantastic, but they did really fall off in the playoffs and never looked like progressing any further, getting into that final, winning the event. Overall, it was an underwhelming year for OG. And in general, Alexi B's time on OG hasn't been a roaring success. It potentially points to the idea that maybe he was a little bit overrated from his time in Ents because I think after Ents, people had him pinned as one of the best leaders in the world. Maybe he does not quite deserve that accolade just yet. And I think even when you watched OG play, there were some times where rounds would fall apart in the mid round particularly. And it looked like maybe the micromanaging style wasn't working quite so well. But I think you do have to pin particularly the way some of those rounds would fall apart in the mid round on Alexi B's calling and maybe say, look, it's not fair to put him up there in the way that we did during his ends time and at the end of his ends time. However, I do still think he's a decent leader. And in terms of as a swap for Nexa, I think that's almost impossible to call. I think... It's difficult to know how much impact Nexus leadership had on the team, particularly when you consider how they did at IEM Winter. And it's difficult to gauge exactly how good of a leader Alexi B is, particularly contrasting his time on OG with his time on Ents. So I think that swap is definitely one that's a bit up in the air. I think if I was to conclude something on it, it didn't seem necessary. So it seems a little weird of a swap to make, but... I think time is only going to tell on that one. I don't think anybody except for maybe people who've played with Alexi or Nexa could give you a very good, accurate, reasonable prediction on how that swap is going to go. The final issue that I want to talk about is Swanee coming in as coach over Malik. Malik, by all accounts, was a pretty good coach. He has gotten a lot of plaudits from people behind the scenes who seem like they would know what they're talking about. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I don't think I have enough information to judge how good Malik was as a coach. The one thing I will say is that G2 had a pretty successful year last year. And the amount that they've changed doesn't guarantee success it 100 percent does not and i think changing a formula that was reasonably successful so much is definitely a bit of a gamble i for one probably would not have swapped malek, malek. i would not have swapped nexa i would definitely have moved amanek to a rifle role i would have probably dropped jacks and brought in monacy see how that goes for a few months and then maybe make some more changes but i understand that the ambition of somebody like carlos who is obviously ultimately in charge of g2 and even i would expect the ambition of somebody like nico who came so close to getting his major i think i can understand why such dramatic changes were made and 
I think G2 is a very difficult one to call. If I had to guess, I do think this G2 will have a potentially higher peak. I expect this G2 to win an event next year. Beyond that, do I expect them to challenge Na'Vi at the top? Again, I think there's too many unknowns. There's too many question marks around some of these moves and, and how this is going to play out overall. I don't think you can confidently predict that these guys are going to challenge Na'Vi at the top. That's all from me on this one, guys. You know the drill. Like, comment, favorite, subscribe, tell your grandmother. Uh, and you also know the drill by now if you've seen more than one of my videos, if you don't like it.